Hi there VC, it's Steve Whitty here, it's Sunday morning, time for the weekly video. Um, yes, I hope everybody has been good, um, I've been well, um, feel been good, been a little bit more busier with work, but uh, hey, that's not a bad thing during the lockdown period. Um, today's video, and I think I might have touched about this a couple of weeks ago, um, it is going to be sort of like going on about glam rock um and partly it's sort of inspired by i've mentioned that i've been reading this book shock and awe glam rock and its legacy by simon reynolds now simon reynolds is a well-known writer um read a couple of these books previously this is an absolute enjoyable book um it's worth seeking out and and, and reading because it's not it's it is about glam rock um but it's also it goes into a little bit more depth than I think I think it is appreciated. Um, recent glam rock is probably the area of music that I'll probably ha hold on to most. It's what I saw when I was growing up as a kid, um, born in nineteen sixty five. So, yeah, when the, the sort of impressions impressionable stage seven eight. Glam rock was in. Um, um, Top of the pops was a must for me. Um, you could see some some of the artists on there. Um, so yeah, so I think how am I going to do this? I'm sort of like sort of go through how it was done during it. It's in, in, sort of in the chapters, and to me, and I think Reynolds glam rock sort of begins. With T Rex, if you can get the glare in, this is the Electric Warrior album. <coughs> um, and when Mark Byland appeared on top of the pops, um, uh, with sort of like glitter under his eye, that to many signaled uh, the start of glam rock. And it's he's my first idol. Um, I have no I have my bones about it. Um, yeah. Oops. I mean, how, how can you not having that? Mark Byron is Mickey Finn as well. Um, it's it's a great album. Um, I mean, Mark Byron just had it all. The problem with Mark Byron was he could bullshit for England. <laughs> I mean, if it was an Olympic sport, he'd got, he'd got the gold medal for it. Um, when you hear his interviews at the time. But <coughs> he was a very sincere uh, Um And probably when he died, it was probably the first time that I had lost come into my life. This predated me before any of my grandparents left, uh, passed away. So, yeah, it, it's very much, I think, the founding father. You know, he started up at a sort of like hippie combo to Iron Source Rex. But I think he always wanted to be a star, and he got it. And during the period between 70, 71, 72, he was as big as anything in the UK. Um, get It On, Telegram Sam, Hot Love. Oh, sorry, Get It On, Banger Gong, as it's known in the States, um, which is on here. Um, Jeepster. Just classics, classic singles of that time. There is one guy that features throughout the book and it probably comes no surprise when I say that is David Bowie um, because possibly um, he's, he's the one artist of that period that's left the la lasting legacy and the biggest influence on other acts other genres of music and you'll have to forgive me I think the sun's starting to shine um, and in the book Mentioned Hunky Dory. That's the Ziggy Stardust, the big one. Um, uh, appearance on top of the pops, doing Starman. Such a influence on a lot of people. Um, it was a game changer. Yeah, when he he, he does. It, if you haven't seen the clip, I'm sure it's on YouTube. He does this on the line. 
when I looked at someone at that point, I looked at you, and he goes like that into the camera. And it's uh, he was pointing at people individually. Now, I was a bit too young to appreciate it, but I suspect if I was a teenager, um, you know, you know, where you sort of like think, wow, you know, you don't, you, you, you're sort of confused about what's where you are in life, and have somebody say, yeah, I'm, I'm looking after, I'm looking for you. Um, big influence, yeah. I think Boy George, Joe Elliott, um, Morrissey, Mark Allman. I mean, they've all said that was sort of like a pivotal moment. And then, see, you move on. When Ziggy became, uh, became famous, you got Aladdin Sane. Very much the, the sort of glam there. Um, glam sort of rock album. Um, but sort of venturing out a little bit more. You know, he's got Avant Garde on the title bit, the piano at the, t at the um, title track. Um, well, you know these songs on this. You don't need me to just go on about what the songs. And I suppose in the glam period, you did pin ups, but the last album would have been Diamond Dogs. So, uh, and that Rebel Rebel was his last great black song of the glam era. But as I said, you, you do come back to Bowie. In, in, this book does go back to Bowie. Um, he also, Reynolds also touches upon um, Alice Cooper. And how he built up, so you know, particularly he he goes on about um, how good, great these albums, love it to death, and killer um, were how groundbreaking they were, um, sort of picking up on sort of like the shock elements, where I think he finds. Schools out, and some, that's an album I haven't got. I've never owned a copy. A billion dollar babies were a bit more formulaic, and particularly towards the end of the seventies, Alice Cooper pretty much the original band had gone, and Alice Cooper pretty much got what he wanted. He was like the star on the, all the quiz shows and wherever, and hobnobbing with like so that Groucho Marx and wherever Salvador Dali, and. Um, and that sort of impinged on his music, and the, you know that, that his music was never as good as, as around that period. There is, oh, let me have a drink, a little slurp first. Ah, it's better. There is a section given to what's known as teenage rampage, which was pop, glam pop. Um. And that's probably where I come into come into the glam rock because being young, top of the pops was it. There were various acts that were on glam was in. Um, you didn't have to sound glam, but yeah, if you looked it, you got you got away with it. Um, obviously, probably the best purveyor of this, you've got Slide. They don't look very glam there, but um, they they sort of took to the to to the glam glam image. The you know the particularly Dave Hill, uh, <laughs> um, who I've read has described looking like your aunt had had too, too much to drink. Um, it, they they emphasised the sound, the stomping sound of rock. This was, a, this was you know, this wasn't a, sort of a, very much a lad's band. Um, and they they had a run of hit singles in the early seventies that it 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 put them up there it, it put them up there we you know I wouldn't say up there with the Beatles but they were very close so they were some real not, they they were untouchable in that early seventy period and obviously the, um, coupled with the glam period they just looked right not nobody had that term shiny hat the hat with these like the shiny circles on it. Um, and obviously, I'll go Dave Hill. <laughs> he, 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 he's his lot line to the guards was, "You write them, I'll sell them." You know, and so, so these costumes. But there were other back acts like of that ilk. Sweet. Um, this is the only vinyl album I've got there. Golden Greats again. They don't look very glam there. This has come at the time when they were coming out of it. 
um, very much man manufactured. But they had a period between 72 to 74. They were untouchable. They had songs like Blockbuster, which was their only number one in the UK. Um, Hellraiser, Blore and Blitz. Um, and then sort of all the way to sort of like Fox on the Run, Action of the Sixteens. Um, they started out as a bubblegum band um, who didn't play on their records, but only played on their B-sides. And that sort of gave them more confidence to um, um, to push, uh, um, to play on their records. They were fell under the sort of like Mike Chapman, um, Nicky Chin stable, um, Chin Chap, um, who were sort of like the main pop writers at the time. And they had to really, really knock, you know, force them to play on the records. And eventually they started writing their own stuff as well. Um, but there's some cl sort of classic singles of that period. Um, I, I'm talking my, uh, my, you know, my, uh, my Chapman and uh, Nicky Chin. Um, they had various acts that went going on there. Another one, Mud. Um, there you go. That's what they look like. Not again on the tag of ta ta glam. And it's particularly because they. They then look very glam, apart from Rod Thomas, the guitarist, uh, who tended to wear dresses. He was sort of like the one that was made to look uh, as glam as anything, with big dresses, big earrings, whatever. I mean, he became let, let, went on to become a very successful writer. Um, but you know, songs like Dynamite, Rocket, um, Hypnosis, Crazy, Tiger Feet, that's just a classic pop song. Um, lowly this Christmas, um, and I want another perennial that w that gets played out at Christmas at, at that time of year. It's a great fun band. It was a great fun time to be growing up with the music at that point. Again, another um, another um, one of this uh, Chapman Chin label, Chin Chap label, um, stable Susie Quattro. Um, there's a documentary. Um, I saw on, on Now TV, uh, it was broadcast on Sky Arts about her. Um, she was brought over, Nikki, Nikki Mouse had spotted her, um, thought she had the star quality, so he brought her over to the States, uh, from, from the States to London. And sort of like, tried initially to um, get, um, to sort of like get, um, have hit and then they fell on the formula, the bike, the leather, the biker girl uh, image. And she went on to have this is the debut album. This doesn't have Can the Can on it, to be honest. Um, this is the original pressing. Um, but she went on to have a, a, a big career again. It you know, sort of the image, sort of like she could the image she had, she could um, hold her own with the lads. Um, yeah. A husband, a future husband, then I think it's then uh, then Tucky uh, who's drinking the beer there. Um, yeah, and, and so you know that that was great. I suppose unless we're going to have to have a slurp with this, because my throat's feeling very dry. <coughs> I did um and ah about this. He, he's the guy he's mentioned in the book, and. In the period um, between 72, 74, 75, he was as big as anybody. And he's, you know, his character, he's in jail. But Gary Glitter is up there. Um, he was, he, he was a bit different to anybody else. He had, had a big, he'd been trying since the early 60s to be, um, to make it big. He, Back, he was warm up on for the acts on Ready Steady Go, and apparently he was as good, if not better, than some of the acts that appeared on the show. Um, went to Germany, did the bit in Hamburg, and he come back. He teamed up with Mike Leander, um, sort of like what do what do I do? And Mike Leander had spotted it, and spotted the new glam craze. So he said, "Well, I've got this song for you, which is Rock and Roll Part One." And 
and he could nail it, but then he had to do the image. And unfortunately, I mean, he was more of a sort of like the cartoon of it because the best one in the world with the spangly suits and whatever, he was a little, he was always been a little overweight. That's, um, um, but he became very successful. Um, I think one thing the book pointed out about him was um, at uh, you all know why he, what he's in he's in jail he's a paedophile um, basically and there were interviews in the seventies where it sort of indicated that 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 behaviour was going on but obviously nobody picked up on it at that time nobody did it, you know. It, Quite a lot of what's happened is 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 historical, um, and it's very difficult because it's you know you, you can't talk about glam rock, in the pop especially in the pop era, without mentioning the guy, you know you can't just airbrush it. However odious, um, the ma the man it is, um, that's my two penneth worth on it. Um, Not mentioned in the book, but I think I will mention this, um, sort of tagged onto the glam pop. It was a week being Eurovision Song Contest last night and voted the greatest Eurovision song of all time was this, Abba Waterloo. Um, and this holds a special place in race in 1974 because it was the first time I was allowed to stay up and watch it. And this just was head and sh it was. It, I could do a video on the 1974 Eurovision Song Contest on its own, actually, because it's quite a fascinating contest that year. Um, but they adopted sort of the, the glam look, you know, not because um, that was what was in at the time. And then they had the tune Waterloo to back it up, and that stormed. And when it, well, it didn't storm; it, it, it was close. There were some very good songs on that, that year, but it's always remembered as sort of like. As it, oh, it was the best thing since light sliced bread. It was very actually a very close run thing. Um, the fact that the conductor dressed up as Napoleon did help as well. Absolutely brilliant song, and of course it was the launch pad for their career. The book goes on to mention about obviously Bowie's role. Once Bowie became successful, he felt that he'd do sort of like a debt of thanks to his heroes, um, people that he admired. And possibly the best known of these is Lou Reed. He co-produced the Transformer album. Though, it's mainly more Mick Ronson that his fingerprints are all over this. Obviously, Reed had the songs. Um, and it, and he was brought over to London, uh, where he worked with Ronson. And, you know, he worked with Ronson and Bowie. Ken Scott mixed the, mixed the tracks. But he also had, like... Uh, British uh, session players on here, um, Herbie Flowers is on here, Klaus Vormann also plays bass on here. Um, the f <laughs> you got the backing on the by the Thunderfies, uh, particularly on uh, Walk on the Wild Side, and when Lou Reed goes on the Colour Girls go, do, 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 and we're, well. That was a myth, Miss Iron because they're probably all mid they weren't, they were white middle class <laughs> girls that were doing that. Um, um, who else is on here? Um, I'm just trying to think. I thought Rick Mack Wakeman was on here, but it doesn't appear he was. But this was his biggest um, album. It sort of gave him a career because his first debut album had gone, and this this hadn't worked out. Uh, Walk on the Wild Side hadn't had been a hit. Um, he might have been totally lost to music full stop um, so that was he took, though he tried to play it down I think he knew he owed Bowie and he did stay friends until the end of Lou Reed's life they kept in touch I think he, he was sort of thankful another band he gave a head uh, Bowie gave a um, a leg up to uh, it's Mott the Hoople um, famous story, story was that um, he was um, over in Watts had come to Bowie and said you know, do you know anyone, any bands that are looking for a bass player and he goes what, what's happened and he says we're going to split up, Motley Hooper are going to split up Motley Hooper had gone done for about three or four years he just 
con making it out done four albums for Ireland, constantly gigging and didn't just weren't getting anywhere. The re so while it were good live, it just never replicated to record sales. And so he goes he goes he goes, he goes so he's like, No, he can't do that. He can't do that. So he, he linked him up with his management, Tony the Three uh, Tony the Three's got him to on there, on on main man. Um, got him a new deal with CBS but then obviously he said well I'll give you a song so he offered them Suffragette City or All the Young Dudes and they went with nah, that not like it but it's not really us we'll go for uh, All the Young Dudes and probably the best decision they made because um, it's the song that to me maybe just represents the whole glam period the sort of the rallying call um, to teenagers at that point the opening Mick Ralph's um, piece on the guitar and then Ian Hunter just sort of like giving out the manifesto you know sort of talked to kids that lived on the council estates that didn't you know um, shopped at Marks and Sparks um, uh, I want my T-Rex you know the, so, so, it just absolutely just and but and Hunter's vocal delivery is absolutely wonderful on this. Um, so that's what the album that came up. Soon left the main man, um, and Hunter has gone on to have a Morocco career a, a career out of it. There the Hooper did obviously Martin and the Hooper. Uh, he left. Uh, Hunter um, did has had a solid career. M amazing that at that point Ian Hunter. Well, Ian Hunter was born the same year as my dad, so. Um, he was in his early thirty, early to mid thirties when success came, uh, came came to him. So he was a bit out of step. So he could look at it um, as someone that was older. Um, chapter was de dedicated in the book to this band, Roxy Music. I think they they un cannot be understated. But what interesting what Reynolds pointed out about um, about Roxy Music was. They looked futuristic, but the music was very much of the past. Um, it, it sort of drew on past influences. I've mentioned about on the debut album, Hum Humphrey Bogart, and 2 HBs about Humphrey Bogart. Um, you know, he was looking at you, kid. Um, uh, remake, remake, remodel again on the debut is and where they do their solo pieces. It's all stuff that's from the past um <clears throat> this is the this is the zenith their best album last album to feature you know um and it's it, it's just an absolutely gorgeous album gorgeous album and it's sort of very much the last if i have to open it up you still got the guys very much in their glam period, and there's Eno. Um, the problem was that Eno's looked so that flamboyant. Um, he'd um, he sort of overtook it. It was it was that Brian that people were looking to, not the Brian Brian Ferry that wrote the songs. So in a way, to remedy this, he set up his own solo career at the same time, pretty much. Um, these foolish things. His debut solo album. He's pretty much a covers album, um, but he reinterpreted his songs in his own own way. Um, Hard Race Gonna Fall was the big hit single off here, um, but you know there was all this album. You know, just don't worry, baby. Um, um, Simply for the devil. Tracks of my tear. All totally different. Um, but again, it was a nod to the past, um, rather, you know, in, in a way it sort of showed, showed, showed up very, wanted, very wanted to be the star. And, and it ultimately, it could never work with the pet, both him and Eno in the band. Eno was going to be the star, Ferry was going to be the star. Um, so there, it, it, it ended, one had to go. Um, I think the girls sort of latched on to Eno as well in that stake and he was not very slow to take of that not take not very slow to take advantage of that fact I mean, there's a famous story where 
in, in mentioned in the book where he, he ended up being hospitalised because he went on at night up for 30 hours, and during which time he bedded six women, you know. You know, I think he, 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 he sort of collapsed with the exhaustion. Moving on, this is going to be a long video, I apologise for that. Um, there's a section about New York Dolls, and you can't talk glam without mentioning them. Um, came over to the UK, lost the drummer, Billy Mercia died, and come back, famous old grey whistle test appearance, uh, where... The, the presenter Bob Harris sort of like he, he made an off remark quick call it mock rock you know he did smile when he made it it wasn't his cup of tea um, it was fair to say um, he got a lot of stick band that seemed to offer a lot but didn't sort of couldn't quite deliver there was too many addictions that were flattening around um, and my, um, too much too soon followed and it was a bit of a mishmash but their influence you talk about legacy, you go on to the punk because McLaren wanted to, before he did the Sex Pistols, he managed the band, he got them dressed up in red. I think he wanted to bring Sylvain Sylvain over, um, sort of like to lead the, like the punk band before he set, settled on Johnny Rotten and Pistols. And, absolutely, you know, wonderful album. Uh, legacy, again, a lot of fans. Morrissey, big fan. Um, of of them quickly go through sort of acts when I mentioned about pop um, glam pop a wizard falls into that but that was mainly singles their albums were slightly different um, this is wizards brew this is more prog than anything they are dressed in there it sort of you know you can see Roy Wood as the sort of the wizard character um, and then when they did another album Eddie and the Falcons I think um he uh, sort of sort of was like glam, glam there, yeah. but he took the glam there, the makeup. He was very, yeah, you know, just dressed it up over the top. They were more taking the piss out of it more than anything. They were sort of top the pops is just having a bit of a laugh. Um, other bands on the back of glam, you got Cockney Rebel, Steve Harley. Steve Harley was a was a journalist, trained journalist. Quit that to become a musician, busker. And he, he rubbed people up the wrong way, particularly in the press, because he knew how to play the game um, with his statements. The band itself was probably more unique, the Cockney Rebel, um, because he wasn't he didn't want guitar. He played the guitar, but he wasn't the lead guitar. They had a violinist there, um, um, John Paul Crocker, uh, and that was sort of like the lead instrument on this album. This is a really good album, Hideaway, um, Sebastian. Chameleon, um, no hits off there. He did have hit singles with um, Mr. Soft and Judy Teen. The original Cockney Rebel did split up. Basically, it was Harley's vehicle. Harley wrote the songs, and some of them went up and said, "You know, I'm not putting up with this. You know, you either give us songs, give us a chance to write songs, all right." And he said, "Well, in a way, bye bye." And that sort of inspired, that inspired, was the incident that inspired his biggest hit single, Come Up and See Me, Make Me Smile. Um, that was the story behind that. Harley's still going. Um, he's, uh, does, he, does his sets now. He was a DJ at one time on Radio 2, did sounds in the 70s. Um, another ant fact that got tagged into the sort of the glam, though they weren't glam, um, Sparks. Um, two male brothers. You've got a strong image there. You've got, um, obviously, Russell as the pretty boy. And Ron, who was Ron, you know, the Hitler Tash and whatever, wherever. I mean, when they did uh, this town big enough for the both of us, that, that was there. <laughs> Everybody at school was talking about that afterwards. Um, they were really popular when that became that can this town ain't big enough for both of us was the number two hit single. They was popular. They were getting ripped apart by the girls. They were at that point. I mean, the singles slowly went down. I mean, they're just about to bring out a new album, um, but they were really were popular. I think mainly because of Russell uh, Russell had the 
had the had the looks. Um, another band that caught on, held on the tags of, of glam. We're talking Queen, and and Freddie Mercury would admit it. You know, the the, the early age was based on glam rock. Glam rock was in, so that's how they took it. And you've got this iconic Mick Rock post uh, photo on the second album, which they would replicate on the Bohemian Rhapsody video. They were smart enough to move on from it. Um, but that, that period of 74, 74, 70, you know, 75, they were very much dressed as glam. Um, another band, Bebop Deluxe. Um, this is their debut album, Axe Victim. You can see from the back there, um, the band very influenced by glam, at the, which was which was it at the time. Um, I mean, Bill Nelson, another one that was smart enough to change. Um, he got he basically broke the band up and restarted it after this album. He didn't really want to be too associated with, with glam. And then, we, obviously with glam, one of the big things with glam was the showmanship. And nobody in the 70s got, was as big a showman as the Sensational Alex Harvey band. You could argue Kiss in the US, uh, but that's, they're not mentioned in the book. Um, but there you go, Sensational Harley, Alex Harvey band. Alex Harvey was a veteran of the 50s rock and roll scene. He'd um, played Hamburg. It's Alex Harvey and his soul band albums are worth, uh, a, you know, a, a rare as hen's teeth, and they're worth a lot of money if you can get hold of one. Um, but he built up a show. He got he he found a band called Tear Gas that was sort of like struggling. He took them on and developed this act. Um, played this sort of like Mercury Glaswegian, absolutely wonderful. And in the States, another band that sort of took based took the elements of the, the big show, sort of influenced by Alice Cooper, Tubes. Um, yeah, you listen to the live album. It's absolutely there. It, it is a show, but uh, things like White Punks on Dope heavily started on the big stage show. Sort of like heavily lifted from glam. Absolutely, again, wonderful. Another band I'm going to say that was sort of like influenced by the glam, but there's that they say there's always you know top bands that were the mix between. Glam and punk. I'll give you Doctors and Madness, Doctor Richard Kid Strange. Um, absolutely wonderful. I've got two of their albums. They only did three, um, but absolutely wonderful, wonderful. Very a bit like Steve Harlan Cockney Rebel. Very heavy on the sort of like the violin as the lead instrument, sort of distorted violin sound. Absolutely wonderful stuff. Well worth seeking out. Um. He goes back, as I said, the book goes back to Bowie. He obviously mentioned Station to Station. That then becomes a big influence. And this is where the legacy comes into it. Because that then sort of like it gets picked up in the UK. You have bands like Ultrabox, who um, the Sisters of, uh, of Romance album, which I think might have been... I'm not sure it would be the third album. It'd be the third album, um, and you can see where, where that what they've been listening to, sort of station to station and and the like. Um, but image sort of had a nod to sort of like image wise, sort of like rock, more Roxy music than anything. Um, they. Obviously, when Bowie uh, went to Berlin, so did Iggy. And, you know, as it says there, Iggy started, sort of, the career started to have a comeback, uh, thanks to Bowie, The Idiots, um, which was the first album. Um, and sort of like, you know, things like songs like Night Clubbing, I see China Girls on here, which um, Bowie would um, use on, the, on his Let's Dance album. He'd go, he'd go big hit for him. And obviously, he meant that... Um, that uh, um, Iggy would have some some rort, steady form of royalties coming through. So in a way, he helped his mate out, ultimately financially as well. And he did it with the Tonight album. 
Bowie at that run that station to station period, but you know, the Berlin period was heavily influenced by these guys, uh, Kraftwerk. Um, this is Trans Europe Express album, and on the title track, it, it name checks David Bowie and Iggy Pop. Um, absolute, again, absolutely wonderful. The book sort of rounds off there. There's a big gap, obviously, a big gap to the 70s, 80s, but the final chapter of the book sort of goes back to Bowie and sort of highlights obviously Black Star and where Reynolds sort of talks about how he felt when he heard the news that David Bowie had died. It's quite touching actually. Obviously big music fan and journalist and music fan. It's it, you know all the tributes go on about sort of about that legacy. So I'll go back to the book. Is it worth having? I, I definitely would recommend this book. It's absolutely wonderful. It came out a couple of years ago, so some of the information might be a little bit out of date. But it's well worth seeking out. Um, it, as, a, as a historical point at the time, there were quite a few facts I didn't know. I thought I, I, thought I knew a, a fair deal, but there were quite a few things I didn't know. Um, and it's well, just worth seeking out. Glam rock, that early period, it's just a, it's a comfort space for me. <laughs> yes, it's a happier times, innocent times for me. <laughs> Though from reading the book, they weren't so innocent <laughs> for the part participants, but for me, it's just happier, happier times. And I'll, as I say, I always got, we'll go back to glam, um, glam rock. There's a lot of bands of a bit of glam rock, and I need to sort of chase, chase upon, but it's. I haven't mentioned the likes of uh, the glam popular like Shawaddy Waddy where they were more Ted's than glam, so that's that. So there you go, VC. That is my video for this week. It's a bit of a long one, a bit of a ramble, but you could say. Um, I hope that you've stuck with it and that you've enjoyed it and you might have, you know, might inspire you to go and dig some of these bands out. Um, particularly more of the glam pop range. Um, so Hope you have a good week. Week I've got a Zoom meet up with um, some of the VC, UK VC guys tonight. I'm um, looking forward to that. Um, so wherever you get up to this week, uh, VC, make sure you have a good. One. I've got some actually got some days off work. You know, where well, I'm working, I think I ain't got to um, go. I, I'm at, I should have been at a festival um, this coming week. Should have been at the Bearded Theory. And of course, obviously, with lockdown, it's all been can. It's been postponed to September, but to be all honest, I just can't see that happening. So I suppose there's always next year, hopefully. Um, so wherever you get up to, VC, make sure you have a good one. Look at um, if you're new to the channel and you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Love the interaction and do leave a comment. Do appreciate appreciate the fact you take your time out to watch it. There's a lot of content going on. Easy. In, 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 a, in a sense, it's, it's maybe some could say there's too much content, but you can never have enough people talking about music. Um, you just got to pick and choose. So wherever you get up to, make sure it's good. Look after yourselves. Keep spinning. More importantly, keep them smiling. <laughs>